Hey guys, welcome back to the channel. Today we're going to be going over Chapter 9 of the American Pageant titled The Confederation and the Constitution. From 1776 to 1790, we're going to be using the 16th edition of the American Pageant. If you have an earlier or a later edition or a completely different textbook, don't worry about it, the content's going to be the same. Here are the key concepts for this chapter. They're located at the start of every chapter in the American Pageant. These are basically going to serve as the takeaways from the chapter, and what I like to do is match the key terms to each bullet point, and this will really help you organize your information, so I highly recommend you do it. Okay, so let's get into the chapter. To start off, the colonies have a huge question hanging over their heads. Now what? And we're going to see that the colonies are going to set up a new type of government. But this evolution will also lead to changes in social customs, economic practices, and ideas about race and gender, which we'll talk about in later slides. But in terms of the government, the states had to make their own constitutions. Massachusetts, for example, wrote a constitution and had it ratified by the people, which influenced how the federal constitution was written. And all these states intentionally limited the authority of the executive and judicial branches after their bad experiences with the monarchy of Britain. They know what it's like to have this massive centralized power and how it can encroach on people's civil liberties and individual rights. There's also this idea of giving power back to the people. And this is seen when large plots of land are split up into smaller farms that can be given to many people. And this economic democracy provided people with an equal opportunity, a level playing field. Manufacturing also increased as the US expanded their markets abroad. But one key takeaway from this chapter should be the Articles of Confederation Government. And this was created by the Continental Congress. The purposeful lack of a strong central government led to a lack of authority over basic powers like tax collections and commerce regulations. However, it did provide a significant outline of a government. I kind of think of it as like one of those squiggly rubber pencils that you would get at the Scholastic Book Fair in elementary school. Like yes, it is a pencil, but does it work really well? No, not really. You can't really write efficiently with it. It's going to take a long time to actually get anything done. However, this government was successful in some ways. For example, it passed the Land Ordinance of 1785, which said that land in the Old Northwest would be sold and profits would be used to pay off the national debt that had been incurred from the Revolutionary War. Additionally, some land would also be set aside for public schools, so you're seeing that they start to value education more. They also passed the Northwest Ordinance Act of 1787, which said that Northwest Territory could become a state when it had a population of at least 60,000. So you're seeing that they're also trying to expand the borders and grow as a republic. But one key weakness of the Articles of Confederation government is seen with Shea's Rebellion in 1786. And this was led by Daniel Shea and other Revolutionary War veterans who turned into farmers and protested the fact that their farms were being foreclosed. They wanted the government to issue paper money and lighten the taxes. And to suppress this rebellion, the federal government can't really do anything, so state militia get involved and barely put down the uprising, which shows the need for a strong central government, as the elite fear of a mobocracy where people revolt to get their demands. That's basically what happened with the American Revolution. The people revolted against the British crown, and they got what they wanted. They got independence. So they set an example that people are now starting to follow, and they need to make sure that that doesn't continue. So because of all of these events, we have the Constitutional Convention in 1787. And after an initial failure to launch, the convention led to states all sending delegates, totaling 55, all picked solely by the people. And all of them were wealthy professionals, which meant the concerns of the poor classes weren't really represented or addressed. They hoped to create a government that would easily enforce domestic laws and garner respect abroad, because many foreign relations at this point had bad relations with the US. And obviously, in order to grow as a republic, an international power, hopefully, they needed to maintain strong relations with other countries, both economically and diplomatically. But first, they needed to repair some stuff domestically, starting with a plan for representation. How are we going to represent the people's opinions while also giving some authority to a select group of individuals? And so in Virginia, they come up with the Virginia Plan, where both houses of a two-body Congress would allot representatives to states based on population. Obviously, this is better for larger states because it gives them more representation. New Jersey counters with the New Jersey Plan, which said that there would be one body of Congress where each state gets a set number of representatives regardless of population. And this prevents smaller states from being overpowered by larger states. 
Eventually, this leads to a great compromise, which created a two-body Congress, where one body had representatives based on population, and the other had a set number of representatives called senators. Also, every tax bill must originate in the House of Representatives, which, since it's based on the number of people in a state, it would give more power to the people in terms of taxation. And keep in mind that the Constitution is basically written with the idea of common law in mind. It provided broad, flexible rules of conduct instead of detailed laws, bullet points for every single scenario. That wasn't really what the Constitution was meant for, and you can see this idea of common law favors loose constructionists of the Constitution, uh, which we'll talk about in later chapters. There are also debates over slavery. Do they count as population? And the South, which obviously has more slaves and therefore wants to include them, says yes. But the North, who thinks slaves are property and wants to reduce the South's influence, say no. And this eventually leads to the three-fifths compromise, where slaves count as three-fifths of a person, which is obviously just horrible. You also have two schools of thought as to whether or not the Constitution was good as it was. The anti-federalists, for example, opposed ratification of the Constitution. They were often from the underrepresented poorer classes, and they saw a stronger federal government as a way for the rich to take power from the people. But they eventually give in after a Bill of Rights is passed, which enumerates an individual's rights, and we'll talk about that in the next chapter. Meanwhile, the Federalists, who were often wealthy, wanted to ratify the Constitution and convinced people of the necessity of a Constitution with the Federalist Papers. They warned of all of the things that would happen if there wasn't one, um, talking about you know the ultimate failure of the Republic, which the people had worked so hard to get, and especially after Shades' Rebellion, people were leaning towards ratifying the Constitution. So now let's talk about a couple of miscellaneous stuff. I didn't really know where to put this, but these are some key terms that are in the pageant, so I figured they were important. Start off, the Society of the Cincinnati. This is an exclusive group of former Continental Army officers, and the public mostly thought that it was, you know, a pretentious society, which shows the public disdain for pre-revolutionary and Anglican traditions. Additionally, to further sever ties with British traditions, churches were disestablished. They were de-Anglicanized, allowing for the separation of church and state. You also have the Virginia Statute for Religious Freedom, which banned state-supported churches and allowed for religious freedom. And another group you should know about is the Quakers, who created an anti-slavery society. And although the importation of slaves stopped, the domestic trade prospers. And keep in mind that slave rights weren't really a contending issue in the Constitutional Convention. They knew that it would take longer, debates would intensify, and it would be a longer time without a central authority. Besides, there were debates as to whether a slave was even a person. So going as far as to say that slave deserved rights seemed radical at the time and would inevitably take up more time. Aside from that, one key takeaway from this chapter is the idea of civic virtue. This was the concept that democracy depended on the commitment of every citizen to unselfishly work for the common good, that the only way the Republic was going to get anything done was if everyone put aside their selfish interests and instead worked together to create a prosperous society. Obviously, after Shays' Rebellion, this seems like a kind of stupid idea because, like, without a central authority, nothing is going to get done. Everyone has their own problems and they can't just ignore that for the common good. Obviously, that would be in a utopian society, but clearly this republic is far from utopian. Another idea that sort of stems from civic virtue is the idea of republican motherhood. And since women were responsible for caring for children, they were also in charge of instilling democratic ideals in them. And because of this idea, women were put on a prestigious platform as the homemaker and given a little bit more educational opportunities. Obviously, not as much as they deserve, but a little bit more, relatively speaking. That will do it for this chapter. Here are the credits for how we got everything you just saw. Thank you so much for watching. Comment below if you have any questions. Please, please, please be sure to like and subscribe. It really helps us out and lets us know that the video was helpful to you. Thanks for watching.